Well, first, let's speak to journalist Matthew Castle. He was an eyewitness to the suicide bombing in Tunis last week. Matthew, welcome to the programme. Just describe what happened, where you were, what you saw last week for us. Right, so I was in uh, central Tunis, uh, the capital of Tunisia, and on Avenue uh, Habib Orgiba, where there was a demonstration um, by friends and relatives of a young man who was killed by the police a few days or a week earlier. And shortly after that demonstration ended, uh, after the demonstration ended, uh, my colleague and I, we were off to the side, uh, just fixing our equipment and getting ready to keep filming. About 15 minutes after that, um, there was a loud explosion uh, less than 100 meters away from us. And it, I first thought it was tear gas uh, because of there had been a demonstration, but the sound was a bit louder and the smoke that followed was not the kind of smoke that you usually, that you usually see from tear gas. And so we kind of looked over, we went over there and noticed that the police were clearing the scene, they had their weapons drawn, and we saw a woman's body uh, lying on the ground. And we quickly learned that she had indeed uh, detonated some kind of device uh, and set off an explosion that, that killed her and, and, and injured, although from what, from what I understand quite lightly, injured a number of people who were, who were in the area. What sort of security was there during that demonstration? Who were the people demonstrating? Could they possibly have been targets or would it be your impression that this was a random attack and it wasn't directed towards any particular group? Right. Um, I, I don't have, my colleagues and I and everyone who I talked to at the scene, no one seems to think that this uh, bombing, the, the, the explosion was in any way tied to the demonstration. The demonstration was mostly grieving family members who were uh, understandably upset that they lost their, 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 their relative. However, they were also calling for a peaceful demonstration. They wanted to, invo to avoid any kind of confrontation with the police. Um, Avenue Ben uh, Habib Ben Bourguiba is always, it's uh, the center, it's uh, where the interior ministry is located. So there's usually a lot of police uh, located on the street anyway. Um, and it's likely that this woman uh, you know, was trying to target the police and had nothing to do with the demonstration, at least from what I understand. Matthew, how often have you been to Tunis? How well do you know the country? How much time do you spend there? And when you're there, do you get any sort of idea of people living in fear of attacks like this? Because they're fairly rare in the past few years, but clearly there is a security issue across the whole of North Africa, really. That's right. There is a security issue in, in, in the region, certainly, especially in neighboring countries like uh, Libya. Um, I've been to Tunisia a few times. I'm not based there, but I work uh, regularly in the region. And um, Tunisia feels, I mean, since the Arab Spring, this was the country, after all, that, that set off a chain of events that would spread throughout the Arab world. Um, since the Arab Spring, Tunisia has been doing really well, um, all things considered. Uh, in 2015, there was a number of attacks that were claimed by the Islamic State. Um, but since then, they haven't really had many, uh, you know, such incidents that have happened in Tunisia. And security-wise, it feels quite safe. Like, I traveled all across Tunisia now on this last trip, and I didn't really feel any security concerns. Um, I, a couple of observations that I did notice were, you know, there is a kind of freedom that people have now that they didn't have and certainly doesn't exist in other countries in the region where people like well, the police would stop us in the street and Tunisian colleagues of mine would push back, would talk back to the police, would argue with them even. And that was that was a bit striking, not something I'm used to seeing. But something else I noticed was that there's a lot of frustration that still exists, especially among the youth. Uh, there's unemployment, especially when you go to areas outside of Tunis. And this woman's story, the bomber, and in no way to justify or condone what she did, but she comes from that same generation, that so-called revolution generation. So she's 30 years old. She studied. She was educated. Uh, she had a master's, I believe, in English. And according to her family, she could not find any work or any opportunities in Tunisia. Um, she didn't seem to have the ideological past that a lot of the other uh, attackers in Tunisia have had. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of the, the country is doing generally pretty well, but uh, it does still have its challenges. And hopefully this was an isolated incident. It seems like it was, and, and people, life has gone back to normal. 
Matthew, we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. Matthew Castle speaking to us about being there on the scene of that suicide bombing in the Tunisian capital last week. Well, let's bring in the panel now because we're joined from Tunis by Ahmed Bouazi. Ahmed is the co-founder of the opposition reformer current party. In Middletown, Connecticut, in the United States, the Tunisian affairs analyst, Mohamed Dia Hamami. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, I should ask you, first of all, Ahmed, do you agree with the assessment of Matthew Castle there that to him it seemed like a random attack? Yes, and it's really very uh, strange and, and the way that the police did not declare anything about uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, event. Uh, we don't know uh, any um, organization that uh, uh, claimed the, uh, the bomb. Uh, and what, what is also is strange that uh, it was not an explosive uh, belt. It is um, maybe uh, more uh, uh, a handbag full with uh, explosives and it was not really very strong explosive because uh, the body of the woman, uh, there was uh, only uh, a big hole in, in the left side uh, of her body and uh, she, all, all the other body was intact and the, the number of um, injured people, they were um, uh, 20, in fact, 15 policemen and five uh, civilian uh, and uh, it, uh, the nobody killed. So we, maybe maybe the woman was a victim also of, of an, an, uh, uh, an organization that uh, put the bomb in her uh, bag and she had to bring it somewhere and then they uh, telecommand it and uh, make it explode uh, when they, they want to, to, to do so because she had all her papers on her and uh, ID cards and, and everything. So she was not going to... Uh, kill herself. It, uh, so we don't we don't know until now. We don't know. We are waiting for the um, the police report on the uh, uh, yeah uh, judiciary. Ahmed, you're speaking to us from Tunis. How worried are you generally about your security there? In fact, no. I I I'm, I'm, I we I can say that uh, we don't really worry. We uh, because um, the uh, attacks uh, first they are uh, limited in places in the especially the uh, mountains uh, of the west uh, Tunisia and the um, um, the problem of mines is very, really very dangerous for uh, shepherds and uh, people working in there. I mean uh, local people. This is really. Uh, 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 we, 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 they, they had to uh, care about themselves because we, they don't know where they put their foot. And but in the cities, uh, we don't have a, a real uh, um, flight. Mohammed Dia, if these assessments are correct, that uh, the suicide bomber was not ideologically motivated. But the fact that she was a woman, the fact that she's a university graduate who is unemployed, does that speak more towards the social and economic problems that Tunisians are going through? And it's almost an act like Mohamed Bouazizi's burning himself alive. Uh, Sorry, uh, if you don't uh, mind, Ahmed, well, this is for Mohamed yeah. Dia. Uh, yeah, so... To be honest, it's difficult to assess if she was motivated by, by any ideology. Because until now, it was not confirmed by any source. But what is striking is the social and economic background from where she comes and from where large number of Tunisians who have been involved in such uh, type of activities come from. So. Uh, Comparing her case to Mohammed ba ba Azizi is not probably not the best comparison that we can make, but it raises necessarily the question of the relation between the, this kind of activities and uh, the economic situation of the country. Um, if uh, last year um, uh, Admiral uh, Akrud, the 
military advisor to President Qayyad Sipsi, was here in the United States, and we've been asking ask the question about the motivations of these people is about ideology or about something else. And he strongly emphasized on the, the importance of the economic condition that a large part of Tunisian society are uh, facing, especially during the last years uh, since the beginning of uh, a large program of reform that unfortunately has been failed. Um, and I think that the link can be made, but it's difficult to make the comparison with the case of Mohambazi's like I said earlier. Okay, gentlemen, let's listen to a clip uh, that TRT World's Imran Garda, my colleague, uh, he did an interview with the founder of Fenakhda, Rashid Ganucci, here in Istanbul this time last year. And the question was about the revolution, the Jasmine revolution that replaced uh, Ben Ali's 24 years in power and what that would do for the people of Tunisia and the aspirations that the people have of this newfound freedom, this democracy, and the economic changes they would hope would improve their lives. Let's listen to the clip. I am completely convinced that in 2011, the Arab world entered the era of democratic change. How long it takes for this change to come is different from place to place, according to the complexity of the situation, and also according to the ability of elites to reach a consensus among themselves instead of elimination, conflict and fighting. So, Ahmed Bouazi, a new era of democracy in Tunisia, but what is it doing for the people? Because as Mohamed Dia has told us, there's an economic problem in the country and people are completely desperate. Yes, there is a big political uh, problem. And I can see even a, a political crisis. Uh, but the economical situation is also very bad, especially for young people uh, and the um, government since uh, 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 2014, they didn't have any program or any project to uh, get out the country from this uh, crisis. The local currency is going down every day. The uh, prices are going high also. We have a 7.5% inflation uh, and uh, the uh, euro uh, is, uh, its, values, its value is uh, 330 uh, dinars and, uh, and everything, everything, everything in the, the uh, unemployment is uh, stable at 15.5%, uh, which is very high, and uh, it can uh, reach uh, 40% in, in some regions, and especially among uh, young people, and especially among uh, people with uh, higher education. And so uh, the situation, I mean, the, the people, they don't see uh, any good future, economically speaking especially. And, and um, I think about 70% uh, of young people, their uh, dream is only to get out of the country and to go especially to Europe or, or North America to uh, find, find uh, a good economical situation. And um, people who cannot go there even, even with going uh, on, on small uh, ships in the Mediterranean Sea, they, uh, they are demonstrating, they are uh, trying to um, live with um, very um, uh, uh, brittle, I mean, a very um, small uh, trade. They are selling um, fruits, they are selling uh, um, clothes and on the okay. street. On Ahmed, if you don't mind, I want to bring Mohamed Dia in here and just pick up on a point that Ahmed's just made there. People going on boats to Italy especially. Five months ago, more than 100 people drowned when a fishing boat sank. Most of them were Tunisians and they weren't very well off. But even those people who are educated and you could say slightly richer than average, they're trying to leave. The Secretary General of the National Doctors' Order says that 45% of newly qualified doctors left Tunisia last year. In 2012, that percentage of newly qualified doctors leaving the country was 9%. So what's the solution here, Mohamed Dia? Um, good question, what's the solution? So um, 
definitely all the problems that you've been raising are existing, but the big question is uh, that politician couldn't answer it. What is the solution? So I think we, in order to answer to this question, we should start by uh, ans uh, 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 asking the question, what is the problem? From where does the problem come from? You mentioned earlier the depreciation of the currency, which is one of the biggest factors that led to this high that exacerbated the disillusion among a um, uh, large part of the Tunisian society. Uh, this is tightly related to uh, the current uh, program of uh, the IMF that has been implemented since 2013. Now we are in 2018, five years of uh, continuous depreciation of the uh, local currency that led to the rise of uh, prices of food and other goods that are imported. Um, in order to be able to change the situation, there is a need to uh, repoliticize the economic uh, uh, reform and bring them at the center of the political debate. Unfortunately, that's not the, the case currently. Um, the debate around economic reforms has, has been absent for decades, not only for the last years. Uh, and the, the regime of Ben Ali, there was no real debate and that led to a structural marginalization of a large part of the country, especially the entire region. So in order to move beyond this situation, we should find ways to solve this structural problem and uh, avoid limiting ourselves to uh, some monetary solutions that are usually suggested by international institutions. And uh, like I said earlier, the program that has been implemented by the IMF is not only leading to the depreciation of the currency, but in addition to that, it is constraining the political choices of the Tunisian government, the conditionalities that are imposed by international institutions, yes. okay. IMF and others, including yes. World Bank and other European Okay, we know about the IMF, yeah. Uh, reduces the margin of action of political parties. Okay, Mohamed Diaz, thank you, because we know, of course, about the IMF austerity measures and the way they affect uh, ordinary people's lives. Just in about 30 seconds, if you don't mind, Ahmed, uh, people don't trust politicians. They don't feel as if they're close to any political party. There was a survey done earlier this year by Afrobarometer. It said 81% of people don't feel any affiliation or loyalty to a party. 79% said that if there was an election tomorrow, they wouldn't vote for any party or they wouldn't know which party to vote for. You're a politician in opposition. What would you do for the people to help them? 30 seconds, if you don't mind. We, we are trying our best to um, explain to them that they have to go and to vote because if they don't vote, other people will vote for uh, the worst for, to, to take the government. And in the last uh, municipal election, uh, people didn't go to vote. We have uh, we had uh, less than 30 percent going to vote in Tunis, the capital where where I am uh, councillor in the in the, uh, uh, in the in the in the in the municipality. Uh, we the, we are the third party. People are uh, going out, out far from the two parties in the power, the Nahda and the Nida, and they are trying in our party, Atayar Demokrati, or uh, something independent people, to try to get different people to govern the country. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for appearing with us on the Newsmakers. Thank you.